Hello, everyone. Good evening. I think um, the two last speakers were the perfect foreplay for what's going to be now a bit more of a conceptual discussion. But um, this discussion will obviously not be led by myself or myself alone. So I would like to invite the panelists for this session to join me on stage. I uh, would like to see Faisal Daji, Amal Ushnan, Abbas Parzegar, and Zainab Joshkun on this stage, please. So, as I said, um, we had wonderful hands-on um, contributions. What we are going to do is a bit more conceptual. We will speak about pluralism. And um, as you, as an audience, are already warmed up, I'm going to also start with a question to you. Um, when we look at our region, at, when we look at the Sharq, um, how many of you would agree that the Sharq is a region defined by diversity. Hands up, please. I'm surprised. I thought it would be more hands. That's fine. How many of you would agree that we are a region in which pluralism exists? OK, even fewer hands. So I was hoping to see a bit more of a contrast, but regardless, um, we, we look at a region where we have, and this was already shown in the previous contributions, uh, a whole range of different identities along different lines, uh, be it ethnicity, be it religion, be it age, or multiple other things. And the question really is, how do these identities coexist? And I am glad to have four wonderful panelists here with, with whom I'm going to discuss this question. And I am extremely proud that on this panel, we have a perfect gender balance, which is usually not the case in far too many panels. I think that's worth an applause. <laughs> and um, since time is really tight, and I think we have a delay of roughly one and a half hour, <laughs> we will keep this very, very efficient. And um, the good thing about these speakers is that they all have worked uh, in their capacities as researchers on the topic of pluralism. So I would invite uh, first um, Mrs. Josh, uh, Mrs. Zeynep Joshkun to start with her contribution on how we can envisage the future of the Shark with regards to pl pluralism. The three questions that, that we asked them to include in their contribution was, what are necessary steps to develop a truly pluralist society in the Sharq. The second question would be, how can ideologies that object pluralism be overcome? And thirdly, what is the role of the youth, in other words, you, to achieve pluralism? Mrs. Joshkun, please give us your thoughts on this. And you have roughly five to six minutes. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Abbas, and um, welcome you all. Uh, it's great to see such a crowd here today. Um, so since we had like 10 minutes before, now five, so I'll try to quickly um, make my points. Um, constructing a plural society in the Shark region, even the title assumes that um, we, we are some kind of, in some kind of homogenous arrangement within the Shark community. However, our history, tradition, the past and present sociology like, shows us we couldn't have been more wrong. The region is going through another episode of its 200 years of troubled and almost schizophrenic societal experience. The ethnic nationalism of the 19th century, followed by emerging nation states, then all of them started to see minorities or the people who they see as different or doesn't fit into their uh, categorization as threats and potential traitors. And moving from there, we moved into, with the emergence of Israel, more into uh, religious nationalism, and then the Kurdish questions, uh, and finally, emergence of violent extremism in the region. These all pushed into the thing, like pushed us into this impossible mission to construct a homogenous society. 
However, what we need to do is we already live in diverse plural societies. What we need to learn is how we can live with them peacefully. In this speech, I want to quickly go through some of the obstacles on our path um, that, that stops us from living peacefully what we have been already born into. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take some of the concepts that we always know and try to problematize them and see how they become obstacles in our everyday lives. First, I want to start with ideology. We are living in a post-ideological world. Some of the ideologies we hang on to in today are products of different sociological conditions. Let's take, for example, Islamism. Islamism has grew as a reaction to movements of early 20th century and late 19th century, modernity, communism, ethno-nationalism. So it was a product of its time. Although Islamism is still relevant today, being an ideology itself, we need to realize its limitations. I'm not saying that we should drop all ideologies for plural society, but we need to realize I, something being an ideology in itself means it has limits, and it excludes some things that are existential. Again, walking through our Islamism as an example, Islamism only takes particular ideas values and uh, rituals of Islam and highlights those as a response to a particular social phenomena. So it's important to understand that as the sociological conditions change, we have to recalibrate, readjust our ideologies. And sometimes, in the case of some ideologies, we have to get rid of them. So as soon as one thinks ideologies are all encompassing, then it becomes, it pushes us towards rigidity and exclusion. So I'm not saying drop ideology, but realize that all ideologies, all isms are not wholesome, holistic, and also they have limitations. The second issue I want to problematize is identity. As ideology, identity is a social construct. There are, these are like ideology, identity, these are important tools to organize, to discern, to even rule and exercise power in our societies. However, what's important that, to realize that we create these constructs and they are not existential. So as the time and the sociologies change, we have to, again, readjust, calibrate, or if necessary, get, get rid of some of these constructs. And the, the third problem in our, uh, that we face in achieving peaceful plural societies is ignorance of the past and carrying the problems of the, um, and the wars of the past to today. None, um, so we know that we have, it, as Ibrahim Cullen today vastly explained, we are sitting on a treasure. We have a very rich tradition. So I sincerely believe people who do not know their past cannot establish a peaceful and stable future. However, I'm not talking about anachronistic and almost like retrospective reading of the past in today's norms. What we really need to do is contextualize the past and read it in its own dynamics. We do two mistakes when we read the past. One of them is creating constants and absolutes from the past, and second is carrying over the problems and enmities of the past to today. So when we read our tradition and when we learn our tradition, we get this word, uh, we do get the sense of revival. However, our magic word is not revival. Even the biggest scholars of our history, Ghazali, Ibn Khaldun, Ibn Sina, they wrote their work within the context and sociology of their own time. So taking ilim, sciences as absolute, and trying to achieve revival is misleading. There will be part of their work that is rendered irrelevant or even problematic for our times. The key word is rebuild under their guidance. You learn and reapply knowledge uh, that they shared, but do not take them as absolute truth. The sense of rev revival created another problem. For example, we talked in the morning again, Orientalism, and we created Occidentalism, as if the sciences of the West, as if we have everything in our past and we don't need anything from the West. And that Occidentalism was also despi that despising of others is also another problem, and that's not helpful. And the carrying over the enmities and the problems of the past to today for example, I, I want to run this through a quick example. For example, the Kurdish issue. Recently, we have had this referendum, and we have been talking about it. And I ran into one scholar. He said, you don't understand. It's a 1,000-year-old struggle. 
And it's like, yes, I don't understand how that struggle can be thousand years old. And how could anyone have borne it? Is it possible? Was there actually a nation state that's based on ethnic lines a thousand years ago? Because there was no Kurdish ethnic state a thousand years ago, that means it still occurred a 1,000 year old struggle. And why? why burden the people of today with the mistakes that every, almost all nations made in the 19th century? Because you see it as a historic moment. So all these overblown commemorations, memorials, remembrance days, all this anachronistic and retrospective reading of the past is creating problems. We're carrying burdens of the past to today. I want to finish with the last point I have is othering, finding others in our societies. When there's one verse that I really like, which is the Hujrat 13. All mankind, indeed we created you from a male and a female, and we made you into peoples and tribes that you may get to know one another. Indeed, the most noble of you near Allah is the most righteous of you. Indeed, Allah is all knower, all aware. So, giving, you know, trying to exercise what I preached, I want to use Ibn Sina very quickly in this context. Ibn Sina ex explains existence in three terms. He says there is the absolute, the daruri, and he says there is mumkin daruri, the necessary possible create existence, and there is mumkin, there is a possible existence. Hum human beings go into the mumkin, the only absolute, but in his, in his way, the only zaruri that everything depends on is God. And human beings, in this context, goes into the mumkin existence, which is conditional, the possible, the changing. So if we are, in our creation, part of the possible mumkin, that also means we exist in different states at a time. How can ever any sociological con construct that we have made can be constant, absolute, and rigid. In, in this way, uh, we need to reapproach our societies and reduce that rigidity and realize everything is a social, sociological construct, and as sociologies change, we need to change. My final point comes, as we always talk about different minorities, groups, religions, but one of the biggest troubles I find in all societies that is for, in, the, in the face of pluralism is sexism. In the ayah, it said, we created you from, you from, you from a male and a female. Um, so I think one of the biggest troubles of our region is also built on sexism. I, um, so my example for this is we just pa passed Eid al -Adha. We just passed Hajj recently. And anyone who has done Hajj or Umrah, the pilgrimage, what is the most the ritual that you keep doing? The sigh. The sigh is what Hajar, Hagar, Abraham's black slave wife has done to find food and water for her dying baby. She kept going between two mountains, Safa and Narwa, seven times. And since Abraham, since Ibrahim all, and today all the Muslims do this, repeat her actions to complete their, their obligatory rituals. So what is Islam? Islam is making all the people repeat to understand the troubles of a black slave mother. So Islam is a religion that surpasses race, class, and gender, and we should all follow. Thank you. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Mrs. Josh Kuhn, for uh, indeed inspirational thoughts. And I think this is the overall idea of our panel. We, we may do not have much time for discussions, but interesting and inspiring thoughts can, of course, be raised. And I think the, the idea that ideologies or identities per se are not a problem, but need to be adjusted in, in order to be um, uh, tolerant towards others is, is a key, key point here. I would like to go to, to Faisal. Um, and I'm glad you made it here. I heard you had a little bit of, a, of trouble with your, with your uh, travel coming here, but we're, we're happy that you made it and uh, even more happy to, to be listening to you right now. Please. Thank you, Adnan. No trouble at all. Got here safely early in the morning, but that's fine. So let me start by saying that on 27th April 1994, Nelson Mandela was elected president 
in South Africa's first democratic elections, ending the country's era of apartheid. In Rwanda, earlier that same month, Hutu power began its mass genocide of between 500,000 and a million Tutsis, as well as tens of thousands of Hutu, Hutu moderates. As Professor Mahmoud Mamdani stated, if some seer had told us in the late 1980s that there would be a genocide in one of these two countries, I wonder how many amongst us would have managed to identify correctly its location. This statement prompts the question of what led to South Africa's relatively smooth transition from apartheid to a democratic state, while 1,500 miles north, the Arusha Peace Accord ended in an ethnic bloodbath. A divided society is compromised or composed of groups formed along ethnic, racial, religious, regional, and class lines. The post-Second World War solution to conflict generally fell in two camps. Number one was the Nuremberg solution, and number two was the ICC solution, the International Criminal Court. Nuremberg has been turned into a template for how to deal with mass violence. But Nuremberg took place at the end of a war between states. It was the product of victory on one side and defeat on the other. The essence of South Africa's situation was that it was a stalemate. Both sides acknowledged that. At Nuremberg, the logic of the victorious powers was that victims and perpetrators must not share a common future. The end point of such thinking after Nuremberg was, of course, the state of Israel. The victims must have their own state. For any settlement on the African continent, this logic cannot work. Whites and blacks had to live in the same country in South Africa. Hutu and Tutsi have to live in the same country in Rwanda. Of course, there are exceptions. Ethiopia and Eritrea, South Sudan and Sudan. But these are exceptions. We are looking for a process that will help to construct inclusive communities rather than separation. Wherever we have tried the, the judicial model on this continent, which is Africa, a solution has evaded us. Wherever we have tried or had a modicum of a solution in Africa, the heart of it was a political and not a judicial, judicial process. And some examples are, you look at Mozambique, Renamo, which was the opposition, and a violent political opposition now sits in government. Compare this to Uganda, where the LRA, the Lord's Resistance Army, is still viewed as having committed acts of terror, and so on. The Ugandan parliament passed an amnesty bill for the LRA, but the presidency, in cahoots with the ICC, ignored this, and now the LRA leadership is on the ICC wanted list. What is it that we cannot have is that a winner takes all process in a divided society. In South Africa, we had the 
Convention for Democ Democratic South Africa, which led to various concessions, allowed for local democratic government and redistribution without the consent of, of the minority. The problem is that for a durable and inclusive solution, you are going to have to bridge and mediate some very sensitive and sensibility, sensibilities. And this led to another problem that we had to deal with. And that was the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was headed by Archbishop Desmond Tutu. I'm sure many of you have heard of that. But the problem with the TRC was that it defined victims as though no apartheid had ever existed, simply as individuals whose bodily integrity had been violated. That is to put apartheid on the same plane as any dictatorship any in the, anywhere in the world. And I'm reminded of the occasion when, at the end of the exhaustive TRC process, Archbishop Tutu had to hand the report to government. And I was working in government at that time as a, what our colleague called a spin doctor. And two hours before the report was going to be released to the world media, the ANC objected to the release of the document simply because the contents and the issue in the reports had equated the ANC in exile and the crimes that were committed against the ANC and some that the ANC had committed on the same plane and same level as the crimes committed by the apartheid government. So the victor and the victim were identified on the same plane. And it created a huge problem. But apartheid affected the entire society, not just isolated individuals. Its cutting edge was legislation that defined the whole population into groups it called races. Then it passed laws that enabled a minority and disabled a, major, a majority. What is common to the TRC and the ICC process is that both ignore the issue that led to the violence. But there is no real way forward unless we take on the issues. And this is the issue of not tolerance, but acknowledgement. You see, the TRC exchanged truth for justice. What people wanted was acknowledgement of the torture and the crime that was committed. Because if you don't acknowledge the crime, there can be no social reconstruction and, uh, and, and, and reconciliation. There is a difference between political violence and criminal violence. Political violence has a constituency. It's not just about individual per per perpetrators. And that was the prob problem with the TRC. It went after individual perpetrators at the expense of those who were in command. So at the end of the day, people were asked, so who gave you the command and how many did you kill? At the expense of the 20,000 to 30,000 victims. So if you want to make, or if we wanted to make the TRC more relevant for the future, this, 
the TRC could have educated the white population that although most of them were not perpetrators, they were beneficiaries. But then it would have had to take the limelight away from torture, and so we had to refocus on who had benefited. Just my last two points. In order to get to the point where you involve in nation building and social reconciliation, you are faced with three major tasks and challenges. Number one is national identity and national reconciliation. Number two, state formation and institution building. And the last one is socioeconomic transformation and sustainable development. Let me end with this as a challenge to the youth living in Europe and other parts of the world. I'm going to call it a challenge to Muslim sensitivities and sensibilities. We, we experience this pre-apartheid and post-apartheid. Number one, when Salman Rushdie wrote his book, Satanic Verses, Muslims were called on to come out and object. In an apartheid society, we are faced with many tribulations. The government was prepared to ban the book. Muslims, if they sided with government, were caught in a quandary. What position did we have to take? And what position did we take? Number two, post-apartheid. A cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad. Muslims in a secular society, what position do we take? That's the challenge for the youth living in secular democracies. Let's see how they relate to that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Faisal, for giving us a, a very good hint as to what processes on the ground are needed. And uh, your examples came from the African continent, but can obviously uh, are actually universal. I think anywhere else, uh, these are of, of invaluable importance. Um, I would like to come to, to Amal, and um, Amal will speak to us in, in Arabic. And uh, yes, give us your take on how to achieve a pluralistic society, please. Assalamu alaikum, Jamian. Awalan shukr mawsul li muntada sharq wa al qaimin ala hadihi al mubadara. مداخلتي سوف تكون حول دور الشباب في بناء مجتمعات متعددة في إقليم الشرق أولا أنا هنا لطرح الأسئلة وليس لإعطاء الأجوبة وقبل ذلك أول سؤال هو كيف يمكن للشباب أن ينجحوا فيما فشلت فيه الدولة نعرف كلنا أن الدول في إقليم الشرق فشلت في إدارة التعددية داخلها كيف سنطالب أو كيف سننتظر من الشباب أن يقوم ب أو أن ينجح في هذه المهمة وكبداية سوف أسلط الضوء أولا على المفهوم أو المفاهيم الموجودة في العنوان وهي إقليم الشرق الشباب والتعددية أول مفهوم كما هو واضح أمامكم ما يسمى بالشرق أو الشرق الأوسط هو مفهوم تبناه الرجل أو الاستراتيجي الأمريكي ألفرد ماهان سنة 1902 لما تم تقسيم النفوذ بين مناطق النفوذ بين روسيا وبريطانيا فكان يقصد بمنطقة الشرق المنطقة الواضحة أمامكم في الخريطة على اليسار أما ما يتبناه المنتدى فهو دول المغرب الكبير المشرق دول الخليج إيران زائد تركيا فهذا التوضيح مهم جدا حتى نعرف نحن نتحدث أي منطقة نحن نتحدث عن دور الشباب فيها هنا ملاحظة يعني ضرورية وهي 
تبني المصطلحات التي أعطاها الطرف الآخر أو أننا نعرف أنفسنا من خلال الطرف الآخر يعني أكثر من مئة سنة لم نستطع صياغة مفهوم لنعرف به المنطقة رغم خصائصها الثقافية رغم خصائصها الدينية والعرقية إلى آخره فكيف نبحث عن احترام التنوع والتعددية ونحن لسنا قادرين حتى على معرفة ذواتنا قد يبدو الأمر بسيط جدا عند استخدام هذه المصطلحات ولكنه يبني أشياء خطيرة في وعينا الجمعي وسنبقى دائما تابعين في هذا, في هذا الشيء المصطلح الثاني هو الشباب ماذا نقصد بالشباب؟ هناك ثلاث تعاريف أساسية التعريف الأول يخص هو تعريف يعني بيولوجي يركز أساسا على مرحلة عمرية معينة من سن 18 سنة إلى سن 35 التعريف الثاني هو سيكولوجي والتعريف الثالث هو سوسيولوجي يركز أكثر على الدور عن البيئة إلى آخره في معرف في مفهومنا للشباب سوف نتبنى التعريف الثلاثة ف خاصة أنه في منطقة إقليم شرق لو سألنا منهم الشباب سيعطي يعطى المعروف التعريف البيولوجي أكثر شيء يقول لك من 18 إلى 35 سنة ماذا نقصد بالتعددية؟ التعددية هي التنوع وجود عرقيات مختلفة ديانات مختلفة لغات مختلفة ولكن التنوع وحده غير كافي لتحقيق التعددية يجب أن يكون هناك انخراط في الف... يكون هناك فعل حتى نحصل على التعددية والتعددية تؤدي دائما نحو السلام في حين لو يبقى التنوع وحده دون انخراط في هذا الفعل قد يؤدي إلى النزاعات هناك شروط أساسية لتحقيق التعددية أهمها الحوار النقد نقد الآخر ونقد الذات الاعتراف بالآخر واحترامه يعني الوعي باختلاف الآخر واحترام هذا الاختلاف تصنيف فئة الشباب داخل إقليم الشرق أنا اخترت معيارين أساسيين الأول هو معيار الأداء والثاني هو معيار البيئة ماذا نقصد بمعيار الأداء؟ هو يعني أكثر عن الفعل الذي يقوم به الشباب فنجد هناك فئة واعية فئة قيادية وفئة تابعة الفئة القيادية هي فئة تمتلك مستوى جيد من التعليم ذات خبرة ذات ثقافة وهي فئة قيادية مبادرة الفئة الثانية هي أقل من الفئة الأولى هي فئة مثقفة متعلمة, متعلمة ولكن يعني أداءها لا يتساوى مع إمكانياتها الأداء أقل من الإمكانيات الفئة الثانية هي فئة تابعة وغالبا ما تكون يعني يمكن أن تكون فئة غير متعلمة المعيار الثاني هو معيار البيئة طبعا لا يمكننا أن نقيس دور الشباب في دعم التعددية في جميع دول إقليم الشرق لماذا؟ لأننا لدينا دول مختلفة من حيث الإمكانيات من حيث حتى مفهوم الدولة هناك دولة قائمة هناك دولة فاشلة أو دولة منهارة فهناك أربع دول أساسية دول تعيش أزمات سياسية واقتصادية هي قائمة لديها مؤسسات ولكنها لديها مشاكل سياسية مثلا أزمة الشرعية ومثال ذلك مصر أو الجزائر النوع الثاني هو دول منهارة أو فاشلة عرفت حروب مثل سوريا وليبيا والعراق النوع الثاني هي دول مستقرة نوعا ما سياسيا واقتصاديا وربما يمكن أعطاء المثال بتركيا ودول أخرى ريعية يعني دول تعتمد مداخلها على الموارد الطبيعية النفط والغاز فيها مستوى معيشي جيد هذا ما سمح للشباب فيها بلعب دور معين ولكن يبقى الجانب القيمي أو مراقب نوعا ما من الدولة فالدولة هي منتجة للقيم السؤال آخر كيف يمكن للشباب أن ينجح في معجزة عنه الدولة بسلطتها وإمكانياتها؟ هذا السؤال يؤدي بنا إلى طرح ثلاث أسئلة أساسية ما هي طبيعة الدور؟ ماذا ننتظر من الشباب؟ ما هي مصادر الدور؟ ماذا يوجد لدى الشباب من إمكانيات حتى تمكنه من قيام بدور سياسي أو اقتصادي أو اجتماعي؟ النقطة الثالثة هي حدود الدور حدود الدور نقصد بها المعوقات أين يبدأ وأين ينتهي دور الشباب؟
مصادر الدور قسمتها إلى مصادر مادية وأخرى معنوية المادية واضحة هي الهياكل والبناء والثانية هي المال المال ضروري لأي نشاط ويمكن الآن مع مجتمعات التكنولوجيا ومواقع التواصل الاجتماعي يمكن أن نتخلى نوعا ما عن الهياكل والبناء هناك العديد من الأنشطة التي ينظمها الشباب في منطقة الشرق الأوسط أونلاين يعني لا يحتاجوا حتى لمكان حتى يجتمعوا فالتكنولوجيا سهلت هذا الأمر الأمر الثاني هو المخزون القيمي القيم الموجودة لدى الشباب في إقليم الشرق الأوسط هل هي قيم تشاركية أو انعزالية وهل هناك دافع ماذا يدفع الشاب للقيام بدور كهذا هل هو إدراكه للمخاطر التي تعيشها المنطقة هل هناك استفادة من وراء ذلك هل هو مستوى وعي معين وصل إليه الشاب يعني يدفعه للتفكير في المجتمع ويعني التخلي عن التفكير الأناني ربما المحصور في تحقيق الحاجية الأساسية من سكن وتعليم إلى آخره يصبح يفكر أكثر في إطار مجتمعي أوسع حدود الدور أين يبدأ وأين ينتهي دور الشباب ربما هنا هناك مجموعة من العوامل تتحكم في ذلك أهمها الثقافة السياسية هل هي ثقافة تسمح بمشاركة واسعة لكل أطياف المجتمع من سواء مرأة أو رجل شباب أو لا يهم يعني نوع ثقافة سياسية فقط السوق طبيعة الظروف الاقتصادية الموجودة هل هي مشجعة أو لا القيم الاجتماعية كذلك مهمة القيم ماذا يؤمن به المجتمع من قيم ببساطة والجدوى ما الفائدة من هذا النشاط يعني بعيدا عن المثاليات وعن ما ينشر وما يقال لكل فعل دائما ينتظر منه فائدة ما الفائدة من هذا العمل هناك مؤسسات مساعدة ومشكلة للفكر التعددي لدى الشباب أول مؤسسة وهي الأسرة أين يتلقى الشاب مجموعة القيم التي الدين اللغة فكل هذه يعني العوامل المساهمة على المساعدة على نشر الفكر التعددي المؤسسات الثانية قد تكون مؤسسات المجتمع المدني قد تكون مؤسسات كذلك تابعة للدولة الدولة بقوانينها ودساتيرها مثلا في سن سن الانتخاب سن الترشح إلى آخره ففي الـ في الـ الأخير نقول أن التعددية ليست قرار أو بل هي نتيجة لمسارات طويلة سياسية واقتصادية واجتماعية كذلك لا يمكن قياس الدور دور الشباب في إقليم الشرق لأن لأن الدور يختلف من دولة إلى أخرى لا يجب أن نقع في فخ التعميم مشكلة إقليم الشرق حسب رأيي ليست مرتبطة بدور شباب أو كهول ليست مرتبطة بحقوق رجل أو مرأة بل مشكلة جوهرية هي المواطنة في حد ذاتها وشكرا Thank you very much for this uh, highly interesting discussion. I'm sorry that I have to cut short uh, some of the presentations, and I'm very reluctant to do so. At least, uh, I mean, we got very interesting points on um, the necessity to really be aware of definitions, and that we also have to consider where, in which context, youth is active to define to define its role. Very, very, very um, thought intriguing. Uh, dear Abbas, last but not least, um, you had uh, good um, uh, best practice examples for how to achieve pluralism. Therefore, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And if I could just take a, a quick moment out and say a special thanks to the Sharq Forum, especially the hardworking staff, Shireen, Ferdos, Nuseiba, for accommodating us and yourselves for making it through, really, to dedicate the time and energy to be in a forum like this, to travel around the world, it really hands off to you. I'm, gonna, I'm going to make my, my presentation brief, but I'd like you to follow along with me. I have three points, really, that I'm going to be carrying this conversation through, and that is, let us look at pluralism through practice. Pluralism through practice. I want us to recognize that the solution to our problems is often in the problem, and I'd also, also like you to know that you can learn a lot from a river. So let us begin. Right now, the question about pluralism is one that dominates our headlines, our own political discussions, our civil society. But pluralism as a concept, just like our brother Jaffer said earlier, like tolerance, 
is an imported concept, an ethical virtue that is born in a particular historical moment. And while that is good, there are better solutions. Pluralism is a concept that comes out of a particular political thinking that is post-Lockean. So the best examples that you can find about a pluralistic argument already presume a deep and accepted secularism. That concept is, an, is as inapplicable to our societies as the practice of enforced secularism has been on our societies. So a better solution, in my mind, is not for us to think about what could pluralism look like or what should pluralism look like, but I'll ask you, what does pluralism look like? What is pluralism today in our societies? And many of you, by proof of your hands, show that you don't believe that pluralism exists, but I would beg to differ. Everybody in this, in this room has family members that come from a different pluralistic ideological background. One step away in your backgrounds and your families, you have a, a separate sectarian background, okay? You also have gender pluralism. You live pluralism every day in your families, in your neighborhoods, in your local lives. Let's macro just a little bit in the midst of all of this madness in our region. And it's a hard time right now, I understand. I'm not by any means trying to downplay the existence of sectarian strife and violence. It's very real in our region. But let me ask you, why hasn't Kuwait descended into chaos? Why hasn't Lebanon, faced with an increase of 30% of its population, okay, with the troubles that that society has had, why hasn't it triggered another civil war? I will tell you that there are answers there that we have yet to explore. The solution is in the problem. Let's think. Right now, a forum like this, youth-oriented, does not want to focus on the problem. That's a very good thing. Most of you, most of your colleagues, most of your peers are anti-sectarian, full and, full and through in your own personal lives, in your marriages, and in your social relations. You are anti-sectarianism. But I would say that there's a better solution, and that is you can never escape sectarianism because sectarianism, nationalism, ideology, as much as we wish that it were gone, it's still there. It's like chlorine or alka alkaline in your water. You have to explore it. You have to find it. You have to know that it's there. I would say, much like the movie Halal Wayne, have you seen this by Nadine Labaki, who has seen that film? Um, where do we go now? We will never escape these identities, so let us try to identify as ways that we have already dealt with them. In the middle of sectarianism in Iraq, the last thing in the world you want to hear is that Iraq somehow provides a solution. We hear about the sectarian strife. We hear about ethnic you know, cleansing on the level of ethnic cleansing in Baghdad after, uh, after the invasion. But let me ask you, do we hear about the humanitarian cooperation between tribes, between sects, across religious lines that's taking place today in Iraq all across the region? I want to know what are the tools that they're drawing upon that we can learn from rather than us thinking about what should could be. Let us think about what is working. The same thing is happening here in Turkey. I've, tri I've traveled across the border region, and I've seen, I've seen faith-based organizations, Christian, Muslim, Muslim of all kinds of different backgrounds, Sufi, Sunni, Ikhwani. I've seen them all working together, Kurdish, Arab, Turkish, working together in the quest for an insania a kind of new humanism that our brother also spoke about, spoke about. So let us think now. If we're looking at the present moment, let us not get flooded. Let us not throw away the history. We all say that history is important. It's important to read history not just because you're bound to repeat its mistakes if you don't read it, but because you will likely get lost if you don't know history. And what I mean by that is that it is good that you want to embrace the future. It is a very good thing that you're not afraid of the future and that you want, you want to move forward, but it's a bad thing if you want to act like the past doesn't affect you. The future is now, and we already have answers in front of us. We go back to historical examples where we find a Muslim humanism. It was amazing to me when I heard about the emerging, emerging humanism that can be born out of different theoretical paradigms. When I was in Kilis recently, I was in Kilis recently. I was meeting with a humanitarian worker. He was a furniture store owner. He was a, he was a businessman who had dedicated a number of his properties to, to house some orphans and their families. 
And he, I asked him, I said, what motivates you? What's your, what's your background? What are you reading? And he looked at me and he said, he said, now imagine the magic that it took this. He said, I read Ali Shariati. I read Hassan al-Banna. I read Maududi, Sayyid Qutb, and Ayatollah Khomeini. Anybody who can put those in the, fi- in, the, in the same sentence, you know, hats off to you. He said, they all said one thing, but Maulana said it a thousand years ago, and today we learned Ibn Miskaway also said it, insan, insan, insan. The emerging humanism that we're all looking for, that we're all thinking about, that we're all dreaming about, is right in front of us. I would argue that the solutions you dream about in the future have existed, exist now, and you have yet to look at them. Our brother, our brother Darren today spoke about Bitcoin. Imagine this. You know, Bitcoin, blockchain, blockchain technology. How many of you have heard of the Hawala, the Hawala transfer system? The Hawala transfer system has been around for a thousand years in this part of the region. It is a pre-modern Bitcoin, Western Union, and today in the most remote parts of the world where there isn't running water, where there isn't electricity, and we don't benefit from e-commerce, and we don't benefit from an e-oriented future, we have classic institutions that are carrying through and providing UN-level, DFID-level, humanitarian aid using this ancient institution. It's not just an idea to say that we go back to our legacy and we think about this. The institutions today that are serving the most vulnerable in our part of the world have been in existence, and we're not paying attention to them in the quest of some kind of dream for the future. The future is today. So in closing, I want to challenge Al-Sharq to bring together some of the amazing opportunities and nodes that we see before us. Imagine a situation just today where we could map pluralism. I guarantee you that it wouldn't take much for Sharq organizers right now to talk to our dear sister Heather Lesson and come up with one quick, one quick application. I'm sure we could do it. Let us map the lessons of pluralism that we have. By tomorrow afternoon, I guarantee you we could have a thousand real examples harnessing the collective power in this room, not just as an abstract idea, but as a real living example for us to look at what already works, what is already successful, and let us use that to be our aid and not some kind of abstract notion. Thank you very much. Thank you, dear Abbas, for a positive drive into our discussion, and it's actually very helpful to end on that positive note. Uh, I will not even try to summarize what we have heard, and I am, again, I have to apologize both on the one time for rushing our speakers through the rough time, at the same time to the organizers for having caused another delay, but I think we have heard a lot of very, very interesting and inspirational thoughts. So join me in thanking our panelists and enjoy the rest of the evening program. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.